Hello, this is Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and in this installment of my series on underappreciated diseases, I'll be discussing myalgic encephalomyelitis, also known as chronic fatigue syndrome, or collectively as ME-CFS. First, what is it? In extreme brief, ME-CFS is a chronic, often relapsing and remitting syndrome characterized by profound fatigue, post-exertional malaise, poor sleep, cognitive impairment that is often labeled brain fog, and autonomic dysfunction, such as orthostatic intolerance. MECFS is the prototypical example of a disease belonging in this series because it has a singular combination of five attributes. It's relatively common. Many patients are profoundly affected. We have a poor understanding of its pathogenesis. It has no diagnostic test and it is poorly covered in medical school curricula, if covered at all. Thus, many doctors have little knowledge of its manifestations and treatment, and some still express skepticism over its existence or its potential severity, and all of this leaves patients incredibly frustrated. I'm going to spend a minute on the varied names of this condition because just a name can be both confusing and potentially problematic. First. Myalgic encephalomyelitis. What exactly does that mean? Myalgic refers to myalgia, which itself refers to pain in the muscles, which this disease can certainly cause. Encephalo refers to the brain, myel refers to the spinal cord, and itis refers to inflammation. So encephalomyelitis means inflammation of the brain and spinal cord. But the problem here is that in most patients, there is not signs of significant inflammation of the brain, at least in any classical sense, and no evidence of inflammation of the spinal cord. For example, the white blood cell count and protein levels in the cerebral spinal fluid of patients are most often normal. ESR and CRP are usually normal. While some patients report subjective fevers, meaning they feel feverish, most don't have objectively elevated body temperatures. And the disease does not improve with conventional immunosuppression. So while there may very well be cytokine dysregulation within the CNS resulting from or resulting in what might be thought of as microinflammation, MECFS does not externally appear to be inflammatory. The discordance between the name and clinical presentation might in some cases contribute to misdiagnosis and misunderstanding since physicians poorly knowledgeable about the disease may be looking for signs that aren't typically there. The term myalgic encephalomyelitis itself was coined in 1956, and if you read some of the original case series from that time, some of them don't even sound like the same disease that the term is often used to describe today. For one thing, many of the original patients from these case series recovered relatively quickly, and in fact, the original name was given to this disease was benign myalgic encephalomyelitis, yet I don't think anyone who's diagnosed with this today would characterize it as benign. Alternatively, there is the term chronic fatigue syndrome, which was introduced in the 1980s, which both removes the implied pathogenesis of inflammation, while also highlighting the most prominent symptom for many patients, the fatigue. Unfortunately, it has been felt to underemphasize the severity of the condition. It also doesn't encompass the breadth of symptoms patients experience, particularly post-exertional malaise, which is a much more specific feature of the disease than fatigue. One researcher compared renaming ME to chronic fatigue syndrome as if the severe, life-threatening lung disease COPD was renamed chronic cough syndrome. To address these issues, in 2015, the United States' Institute of Medicine recommended renaming the disease Systemic Exertion Intolerance Disease, or SEID. However, there was concern that the IOM did not sufficiently vet the proposal with patient advocates within the ME-CFS community who felt that this term did not really capture their experience with the condition. As a result, SEID has not been widely adopted in practice, that is, it's rarely used outside of the medical literature. At the time of this filming, the combined term MECFS is the one most commonly used by patients in English speaking countries, so I'll be predominantly using that term for the rest of this video. But this disagreement over the condition's proper name 
it's actually about more than just semantics, which I will come back to when discussing its diagnosis. Before that, let's discuss the clinical presentation. Among its clinical features, one that is nearly universal is post-exertional malaise, meaning a general achiness and hard to describe physical discomfort throughout the body that occurs shortly, but not always immediately, after physical or mental exertion. The degree of exertion necessary to trigger PEM is individual specific and can be surprisingly modest. Another nearly universal feature is cognitive impairment, which most often manifests as poor short-term memory, difficulty concentrating, or decreased information processing speed. Common features include profound fatigue, poor quality or unrefreshing sleep, headaches, recurrent sore throat, tender cervical and axillary lymph nodes, myalgias and arthralgias, which refers to pain in the muscle and joints respectively, but without overt evidence of inflammation, hypersensitivity to external stimuli such as light, sound, and smells, and autonomic dysfunction. The autonomic dysfunction can include orthostatic intolerance similar to POTS, episodic sweating, and intolerance to changes in the environmental temperature. Less common but well-described symptoms include depression, abdominal pain, weight loss, and subjective fevers. The onset of ME-CFS can be abrupt over several days, in which case it is frequently associated with a preceding infection, typically a viral-type syndrome. Surgeries and trauma are less commonly implicated triggers. Or the onset of symptoms can be gradual over many months, in which case a specific trigger may not be identified. The severity of symptoms is extremely variable. However, among patients who have been formally diagnosed, the majority are unable to consistently work, and approximately 25% are functionally homebound. The most profoundly affected patients are bedbound and may even require tube feeding for nutrition. When it comes to the epidemiology, the prevalence of ME-CFS is unknown. Due to the varied definitions and diagnostic criteria for the syndrome, prevalence estimates literally range three orders of magnitude, but most sources cite a prevalence in the general neighborhood of 1 in 200 to 1 in 1,000. It most commonly presents in young to middle-aged adults, and there is an observed female-to-male ratio of about 2 to 3 to 1. Interestingly, there have been dozens of reports of outbreaks of ME-CFS-like syndromes, most numerous in the 1950s. One of the most notable such outbreaks affected 160 residents of Lake Tahoe in 1985. Excluding COVID, the most recent such outbreak occurred in Norway in 2004, which was associated with the parasite Giardia, which had been spread via a contaminated water supply. However, it's unclear how many of these outbreaks represent the exact same disease that modern medicine typically considers to be ME-CFS. For example, some of the earlier outbreaks were characterized by objective muscle weakness resembling polio, and some are characterized by a high recovery rate, both of which are not typical of what is now called ME-CFS. Importantly, patients with ME-CFS are not contagious. Regarding the pathogenesis, it is currently unknown. However, there is no shortage of theories. Proposed etiologies typically fall into one of four overlapping categories. Infections, among which the Epstein-Barr virus, enteroviruses, and SARS-CoV-2, or the virus that causes COVID, are the most frequently implicated. To be clear, this does not necessarily mean these patients have chronic, ongoing infections with these pathogens, but rather that an infection had triggered a change to the immune system that persists well after the virus or bacteria has been eliminated from the body. A subset of patients who identify as COVID long haulers have syndromes which are clinically indistinguishable from ME-CFS and which may in fact be the exact same thing. Which brings us to the next category, dysregulation of the immune system. Decreased function of natural killer cells is one of many observed abnormalities. However, unlike immune-mediated diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, it is not generally believed that autoantibodies are playing a role in ME-CFS. There have been a variety of observed abnormalities of hormone levels within the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, 
which includes cortisol, and there is evidence that ME-CFS has a genetic predisposition as well. The diagnosis of ME-CFS can be challenging. Symptoms can seem nonspecific, aside from the post-exertional malaise, which patients may not spontaneously report if they haven't seen the phenomenon described in words before. While there are some physical exam findings consistent with ME-CFS, such as orthostatic vital sign changes and tender lymph nodes, the exam in most patients is unremarkable. Routine lab tests are also usually unremarkable. This combination results in most patients having their diagnosis delayed by months or even years. And even when the condition is suspected, there is currently no confirmatory test or biomarker. Instead, there are numerous competing sets of diagnostic criteria. For example, here's a summary of the 1988 Ramsey narrative description of ME, the 1994 Fukuda criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, and the 2015 IOM criteria for systemic exertion intolerance disease. I'm not going to read through them all, and in fact, there are many more sets of criteria than just these three. Instead, I'm going to show them in a Venn diagram. If we make a circle for each of the three disease definitions and map where different symptoms in physical science fall, this is what we see. Cognitive impairment and post-exertional malaise are common to all three, but that's it. Not even fatigue was included in the original description of myalgic encephalomyelitis. To me, this begs the question, are these even the same disease? To this diagram, one could continue to add in other sets of criteria, such as the Canadian Consensus Criteria or the ME International Consensus Criteria, but the underlying question remains. I'm a hospitalist and not an ME CFS expert, but I do wonder if it's possible that classically described ME and the more recently defined CFS are in fact clinically similar, but yet distinct diseases with overlapping but not identical pathogenesis. This may help to explain why medical science has made relatively little progress towards understanding or treating this condition or a group of conditions, because if studies include patients with different diseases caused by different pathological mechanisms, it will be necessarily more challenging to identify specific epidemiologic associations or biochemical and immunological abnormalities. But as of now, most clinicians, that is the professionals who are diagnosing and treating these patients, approach them as if they are one disease, just with many different manifestations. And most patients also believe these to be the same disease, though they may have very strong opinions on the most appropriate name for it. When it comes to the differential diagnosis of ME-CFS, that is the list of alternative explanations that a clinician should consider before making the diagnosis, it's relatively long. And because ME-CFS has no confirmatory diagnostic test, it is particularly important for these diseases to have been specifically ruled out in some way. For some alternative diagnoses, they can be ruled out by history alone, while for others, additional testing may be required. This differential includes malignancy, fibromyalgia, actual chronic infections such as EBV, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, depression, anxiety disorders, a primary sleep disorder such as sleep apnea or narcolepsy, vasculitis, or connective tissue disease such as lupus, among many others. Regarding treatment, because we currently have a poor understanding of the disease's pathogenesis, there is not disease-specific treatments available. However, an important first step is validation of the patient's experience, as most have suffered with long delays in diagnosis, and some have heard disbelief in the very existence of their illness. Education about the disease, including what's known versus not known, is important as well. The term pacing, or energy management, refers to the identification and avoidance of the individual activity threshold that triggers post-exertional malaise. It's also important to address symptoms in comorbid conditions. This might include sleep hygiene, plus or minus tricyclic antidepressants for patients with prominent sleep-related symptoms, neurocognitive therapy and the use of memory aids for patients with prominent cognitive impairment, and salt and fluid loading and or fludrocortisone for patients with orthostatic intolerance. Patients often require in-home support, handicap placards, 
work or school accommodations, and family members and caregivers may require their own support as well. Cognitive behavioral therapy by a psychiatrist or psychologist is sometimes used to help patients manage symptoms and mentally cope with their illness, though this is not without controversy, and a recommendation for this may be mistaken by the patient as a suggestion that the illness is primarily psychiatric, which is not the case. Cognitive behavioral therapy is not a cure for ME-CFS. Given the lack of disease-specific treatments, many other things have been tried, but they have been found to be not helpful. These are generally not recommended for most patients. Antibiotics, antivirals, immunosuppressives, including prednisone, and restrictive and elimination diets. Graded exercise therapy is a specific approach to increasing physical activity that was previously touted as beneficial, but has since been criticized as potentially harmful, and most ME-CFS experts currently recommend against it. Last, regarding prognosis, patients with ME-CFS can experience relative remissions and improvements in symptoms over time, but unfortunately, an eventual return to the previous level of function is uncommon.